Lord, I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would lead us and direct us in the ways that we should go. Lord, we desperately need your help. Lord, we desperately need to hear from you this morning. Lord, I pray, Father, that as I'm speaking, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would just, Lord, flow and just bring me clarity, bring me wisdom, Lord, the ability to understand, Lord, all things that come from you alone. And so, Lord, may you, your word bless, encourage, and strengthen, bring peace, and strengthen what needs to be strengthened. We thank you and we praise you, Father. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The message today is entitled, Please Come, We're in Trouble. Please come, we're in trouble. Now, this is the cry of this generation. There was a young girl this past week that was in class, and as she was witnessing the murdering of her children, uh, her, her, stu uh, her classmates and her teachers, she was able to grab a cell phone in this Uvalde school shooting, and she was able to call 911. And the 911 operator began to speak to her, and the little girl said, please come, please come, we're in trouble. Now, this is an 11-year-old girl, yeah, yet no one should have to call 911 to say that, but yet an 11-year-old is doing this. And her name was Maya, is Maya. She's an 11-year-old survivor. And to stay alive, she had to do something that no person should have to do, yet a, a, yet a child. And she had to smear blood of her fellow classmate on herself so the shooter would think she was dead. And this is the cry of this generation. Please come. We're in trouble. I want to dive a little deeper into this this morning as I speak about how we can look at a tragic event knowing that God did not cause this, but God will certainly reveal himself through such tragedies. He always has and he always will. And one day, there will come a moment in our time where the Lord Jesus Christ will come back and he will redeem those who belong to him. The heavens will break open. The Bible says that it will be visible from the north, east, south, and west that Jesus Christ will come back in the twinkle of an eye. And many of you know that as the rapture of the church. But I want to talk about something a little deeper that gives us an understanding this morning about the generation that is being raised up, what we have been for the past 20 plus years, what we have seen come to manifest in our schools. Now this is very close to my heart because this past school year, we, we have a K through 12 school for those watching online and may not know. Um, and I, this past year, I was with second, uh, uh, third and fourth graders, third and fourth graders, and, and I shared a classroom with my wife and so uh, we had many kids in there, and I dealt specifically with third and fourth graders. And so, sadly, the students that were, lives were taken this past week were third and fourth graders. And so, and I will just tell you this, they're so innocent. They're so innocent. At this age, they're so innocent. You know, working with them all year long, understanding their mindset, their, their frame of mind, they're innocent in the eyes of God. They're in the age of innocence still that they're curious, they're excited about to learn things. And, 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 they, just, and they, just, they just naturally, they believe God with all their hearts, they do. And so th when this happened, I just stood there in, the, in my living room and watching it on TV and just crying, just crying. I mean, I was crying so hard for the families who have to go through something that will never leave them the rest of their lives. And... I want to read to you in Matthew 21, 15 through 16. It says, But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that Jesus did, the children crying in the temple, they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. The children, uh, the people were ignorant, ignorant, indignant. And he said to them, they said to him, Do you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Now, this little girl, Maya, did not know 
realize that what she was saying is the last verse in the Bible. Please come, we're in trouble. And what do you mean by this? Revelation 22, 20 through 21. The last verse is in the Bible. It says, he who testifies to these things, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This is the end of the Bible. And the Bible ends with a, a call out from the church, calling out to people, calling out to God to come, Lord Jesus, to come. The church is always in anticipation of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church to take to heaven. And why? Because of so much that we will go through, not just as a Christian on this earth, but as a human being on this earth. But for those, the Bible says that no eye has seen, no ear ha has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. And Christ is coming back for those who love him. And so when this little girl uttered that, said, please, please come, we're in trouble. God hears the prayers of the righteous. God hears the prayers of those who are calling out with childlike faith. God hears them, and God hears you. And I want to tell you that do not believe the lies of the devil anymore. The Lord Jesus Christ loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. The world needs saving. The world needs saving. Our generation, this, the youth of America, the people of the world, they need saving. And it can only come through Jesus Christ. No, no, no uh, buttering up of laws, making better laws are going to redeem fallen humanity. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you know that. But when you go into the public square and say this, you're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be mocked. You're going to be made fun of. But I'm telling you, it is the most powerful message that has ever existed and ever will. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word of God shall remain forever. That's what the word says. And so when you speak this message, this gospel message, more importantly, when you live it, not just say it, but when you live this message in your life, you have the the in integrity of God. You have the character of God. There's a holiness in you. There's something different about you. You have the joy of the Lord, the peace and the power of the Lord. And again, church, I'm not standing up here saying I'm perfect. Th this has been the hardest three years of my life. I failed God. I failed my family. But I thank God that he redeems, that he saves, and that I can still stand here before you today. I ran from this call for 15 years. But I thank God that that the Lord has kept me, that he's kept you. And that is what the devil will do. He will chase you down, and he will fight you to the very end. The Bible says that one-third of the angels fell from heaven with the fall of Satan. And there are demonic spirits in this world who do not punch a time clock. They do not need to eat or sleep. They are awake 24-7, coming to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus come, that you may have life, and life abundantly. Now... Again, what we have just read, out of the mouth of nursing babes, out of the mouth of children, the praises of God are, are spoken. And so when I heard this little girl saying to the 911 operator, please come, we're in trouble. Now, they didn't have the audio playing, but they recorded it on print, on paper, that she said this. You know, I, I believe that this is a message to those who know the Lord, that those who have the Spirit of God with them, that know that what the Bible says, this should register in you when you heard this, because the Lord is coming. And the Lord is saying to hang on to your faith in Christ. Hang on to the kingdom of God, because you're almost home. Satan will throw anything at you to distract you. And that's what he said about Job. He looked at Job. And, and, and Satan said to the God, yeah, Job will worship you because you, you bless him. But do this and do this to him, and he will curse you. And what did God say? Do what you need, but just don't take his life. And at that moment, his life was not taken. But sadly, we see now Satan taking so many lives, innocent lives. And some people, they curse God. They blame God. They cry out to God. And this is not a time to cry out to, to, to ministers. It's not the time to cry out to the churches. This is the time to cry out to Jesus. This is the time to cry out to Jesus. This is the time to abandon any religious 
a thing that you were raised up with and have a personal relationship with the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. Because that is what is going to save you. Now, in Matthew 24, 19 through 22, it says, But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. In context of this chapter, Matthew 24, Jesus is teaching about the end of the church age, the end of, uh, of the age as we know it. And he's giving a lot of indicators of what will happen and what will come. And so we are at the end of the church age. And we're seeing evil like never before. And actually in Matthew 24, he says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold in the end. And that is what we see happening. We see this young man who had no hope. He has, could see no future, no encouragement, no, no Jesus in his life. And, and, and they were, his, he was abandoned, so to speak, fending for himself, so to speak. No direction. And that is, that is how it is with a lot of youth today. They're just, they're, they're all for themselves. And they're learning what they see on YouTube. They're learning what Hollywood is producing. And then we wonder why they do such things. And we think that making better laws in this land are going to cure this problem. No. No, that, that is, and I'm getting into something. I'm going to go into a lot of stuff this morning. But Scripture clearly teaches us that the tribulation we are going into right now is going to be so bad like the world has never seen before. And if God doesn't shorten these days, no human being will survive. But for the sake of the church on the earth, God is not going to allow this time to go on forever. That is exactly what Matthew 24 is saying. Now, let me turn corners here a minute. We look at law enforcement. And my son is in law enforcement, our son. And they are highly trained men and women. They work hard, a lot of sacrifice, long hours, training all the time for different scenarios. In my opinion, it's probably one of the most dangerous jobs in the United States because you're doing a job where a lot of people today hate you too. And you're under the microscope at all times. You can do no right. I mean, you can't do right. You're going to do wrong all the time and everything. And you're trying to protect your life. You're trying to protect others. It's a very difficult profession. And so the law enforcement that was on the scene when all of this happened, this is something that God spoke to me about and I want to share with you. They say now that law enforcement made the wrong call in dealing with this situation. You know, we all love children. You want to know why? Because it reminds us adults at a time of the age of innocence. When we look at children, we think back to an age of innocence when we were once innocent. You know, the Bible says that there was no one, that, that all are guilty. There, was, there is not one righteous, no, not one. And so when we become adults and we're at the age of accountability, we're reminded of our sin until we're forgiven of our sin. As we repented of our sin and turned to Jesus. But when we look at children, we're reminded of the age of innocence. We love kids. All of us love kids. And these police officers that were on the scene, they all loved kids. They all love kids. They all have kids, I'm sure. But apparently a wrong call was made. Do you hear me this morning? A wrong call was made. It was a misdiagnosis of the situation, they say. And sadly, society is doing the same thing. We're misdiagnosing the situation here. We want to be quick to point fingers at the local law enforcement and say, you messed up. You did wrong. But yet society is doing the same thing. We're misdiagnosing everything that we're going through as a nation, everything that we're going through as a church. We're doing the same thing. And that's where Jesus says, you hypocrite. First get the plank out of your own eye before telling someone else they have something wrong with their life, something in their eye. 
It's a lot of hypocrisy going on. These officers that were on the first scene that made the wrong decision, they're going to have to live with this guilt the rest of their lives. They, they don't need someone, uh, a Monday morning quarterback, saying, hey, you should have done this, you should have done that. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins, a multitude of wrongdoings, that the love of God covers a lot of wrong in this world. And what the world needs is the love of Jesus. What the world needs is for you, Christian, to stand up and to become the salt and light of the earth and to love. Because love from the Christian through the power of God is what pushes back the hand of evil. Love is what allows God to sustain you. But you see, there's also called something a veil of deceit. It's called the veil of deceit. And not many people understand as though it's clearly written in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18, Paul says to the church, Therefore, since we, meaning Christians, have such a hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, meaning in the Old Testament times, who would put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But in the Old Testament, verse 14, their minds were blinded, for until this day, even today, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled faces, Christians, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. There is a veil over those who do not know Christ today as Lord and Savior. And so when you have that veil, you know, when a bride comes to the groom at the altar, they remove the veil, and they go through the marriage ceremony, and they, they kiss, and they're married. And that is the way it is, spiritually speaking, with a relationship with Christ. Until you ha are not saved by the blood of Jesus, there is a veil over you, and, and that veil will allow you to believe the lies of the world, the lies of, this, of, of the kingdom of Satan. And you'll buy it all the time, hook, line, and sinker. And so you, you, you may have a, a, you may want to do right. You may love these children and want to do good by them. You may love your family and want to do good by them, but if you do not have a relationship with Christ, then you're, you're just wasting time and fooling yourself and fooling your family because the veil of deceit is still there. And you cannot believe the things of God, which are taught from the, the, the pulpit of God throughout churches throughout the world, his churches, because not all churches have the pulpit of God in the church. There are a lot of false teachers out there. There are a lot of false preachers out there. And they are great in number. But God is still faithful, and he has his remnant. But if you will stop playing with God, if you will stop playing with God, and take him at his word and be serious about your walk with Jesus Christ. Look around you. Look what is happening in this world today. Parents love their children. But I see it. So many parents are so distracted by this, this, the signs of the times. They're so involved in their own life. It's the veil of deceit. They love their children. But if you have the veil of deceit still up on your face, spiritually, your heart is still blinded. You cannot hear the good things of God and therefore do the will of God. So where does the problem begin? Where does this problem that we saw manifest in Uvalde, Texas, in Santa Fe, Texas, and over the past 20 years that this nation has witnessed in, in schools since, since Columbine in Colorado, when this first began to happen, over 20 plus years now, we have seen our youth being murdered. Where does this problem begin? Do we need to change the laws to have, you know, 18-year-olds can't not buy this gun, or we have to outlaw this and outlaw... The problem is not there, guys, because, again, you've heard it, but you see, this message is not about political stuff. If somebody wants to kill somebody, they're going to kill somebody. When Cain killed his brother Abel, there was nothing but rocks and dirt... And there was not, nothing else at the time. And he managed to kill his brother. Now, 
I want to make a point right here. Satan is clearly after our children in America. Satan is clearly after our children in America. Just read this with me that I wrote. Parents love their children, but many love their own life, and they have lost sight of the responsibility of the spiritual upbringing of the lives of their children. As a pastor for 15 years, I've seen this. I've even failed my children at times. But if that's you today, get up. Repent of your sins. And that's the babe crying there. Amen? For the sake of children. For the sake of children. They're crying. They're needing help. They're needing rescue. Satan is clearly after children in America. But you know what? He don't have to do anything but just allow parents to hand them right over because that is what is happening. The parents are abandoning their responsibilities. Proverbs 22, 6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Again, Proverbs 22, 6. So however you train your child up, that's the way they go. If you train your child up in the truth of the Lord, in the ways of God, they're not going to depart from that. They may go through trials and tribulations, but they're not going to depart from that. They'll, and if they're gone right now, they'll come back. God is faithful. But if you train your child up in wickedness and evil and deceit with a, with a veiled heart continually, chances are, chances are they'll never, never come to know the Lord. This is the most important job in America, in the world, training up children. Training up children. And so many Christian parents, they too are failing. They'll claim Christ, but they don't follow Christ. And it's more than just coming to church on Sunday. It's more than just coming to the, the children's church on a Friday night or to a prayer meeting on Wednesday night. It's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. The sacrifice of children, whether through abortion or neglect of spiritual upbringing, it's the same in the eyes of God. And we ought not to hinder these kids from coming to, to Jesus. Satan is continually stealing the future. Look in Matthew 19, 13 through 15. It says, Then little children were brought, brought to him, to Jesus, that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. Here's men of God that walked with Jesus, and they were trying to usher the little children away. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them, and they departed from there. Jesus wants to touch the children. And the disciples said, No! You're too busy for that. No, we have a better idea. It, and that's the same thing today. The adults today think they have a better wisdom, a better knowledge of how to, how to raise up children. Well, you know, the churches are so full of hypocrisy. We'll just do our little church thing at home. Really? How's that working out for you? And I'm telling you guys, I remember a pastor who helped train me up said, Michael, years ago, he said, Michael, when you see that they stop coming to church, there's something dangerously wrong. And he said, and it's not just about coming to church. And I'm not being legalistic here, guys. But we see what's happening in the nation today. And the reason why, people say, well, it's because of the church. Yeah, that's partly true. But it begins in the home. Because if your home's not right, you're going to bring that mess to the church too. So we both have to be right in the home and in the church. Me personally, I have to have it right in my personal home. And, and, or if I come up here, you Christian, if you have it right in your personal home, or if you come up here. Now, the greatest thing you can give a child is what? Tell me. Is Jesus. 
You can never give a child too much Jesus. But sadly, a lot of Christian parents think that they give their children too much Jesus. I heard uh, many, many years ago when I, was a, when I was an associate pastor, I heard a, a, a Bible teacher say, well, let your Christian kids go to school, public school, because they need to be the salt and light in the public school system. And I look back now, and I think that is the most stupidest thing that I've ever heard. Because they're too young to be a missionary. They're overwhelmed by the demonic influence in the public school system. And if you have a problem with what I'm saying, I'm sorry. But that is the truth. It is the truth. We have so much parents failing. And, there, and that failure is creeping into the school from the home. And these kids that are coming together, they're, 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 they're bouncing off one another like sponges, absorbing things that you know that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. And this is what we're seeing happening today. Such immorality in the school. Such immorality, rapes and murders and, and overdoses and, and you name it. It's happening in the school system. S teachers having sexual relations with students, underage students, continually over and over and over and over and over again. Such immor immorality in the, in the school system. On top of what they're already teaching with critical race theory creeping into every school system. It, it, it is ridiculous. It's, going, it's abandoning the things of God. And, and the Bible rings true. You reap what you sow. And so... I believe every church, I believe every church, because a church is a place not of just being a hospital, but a church is also a teaching place. What did Jesus say? He said, raise up disciples. I believe every ministry, if you have a church building, you should have a school. And if you do not have a school, shame on you. Shame on you. And you also need to make it affordable for kids to come. Because we, church, we have so many buildings in this nation. And they're only open two, three days a week. That's ridiculous. What other organization operates that way? The only day this building is closed, all praise to God, is Saturday. This building is always open. And all glory to God for that. To him alone be the glory. But we have a responsibility as, as Christians, as churches, to come up alongside families and to help them in the raising of their children. To teach them the word of God, to teach them the, the morals of God, the principles of God. And so many parents have a hard time just bringing their kid to church once a week. And then you wonder... What's going on? Why are they acting this way? Why are they rebelling? Look, the greatest thing you can give a child is Jesus. And I'm not talking about just telling them about Jesus, but living a life showing the power of God, victorious over sin. Now, many are going to be in for a rude awakening. They're going to be in for a reality that what you thought was right was actually to the left of the will of God. We allow the youth to be influenced by idolatry because the multitudes in this nation are in idolatry. And so if the nation is caught up in idolatry, are we shocked to find our youth in idolatry too? In Jeremiah 7, 1 through 11, I'll quickly bring this to you. There's a lot of reading, but I'm going to read it quickly. Now, in Jeremiah 7, 1 through 11, Jeremiah the prophet was the most hated prophet in Israel, but yet he was the one true prophet for Israel. And God was only speaking to him. And in Israel's day, where they were so wicked, this is what Jeremiah said. He says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate, of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are there, are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. This is no different than from today. We, in America, we have all this idolatry in our lives, and we can come into the house of God and say, ah, the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord, praise God, hallelujah. We belong to Jesus, praise Jesus. We know all the songs, but yet God is looking at this, and God says, this is a, a den of thieves. God, the, the Lord looked at Israel, the apple of his eye, and he said, you're wrong. You're shedding innocent blood. How, how do we shed innocent blood today? By sacrificing the generations. By allowing the, the, this, the, this, this youth to be giving in to the hand of Satan. Jesus said that if you so look at a woman and lust after her, it's though as you have already committed adultery. It's the same thing. So therefore, if you give what, as a steward, the things God has entrusted you with, if you give it over to Satan, it's just as if you're allowing these things to be murdered. I'm telling you. Where are you going to hear these messages being preached in the churches today? You're going to hear messages of hope, messages of, of oh, oh well, well, God loves you, and yes, he does love you, but there needs to be a repentance on the heart. I know so many Christians, and there may be some of you watching online. You love the Lord, you'll confess the Lord, but you do nothing in your testimony and walk with Jesus. Nothing. When is the last time you led somebody to Christ if you call yourself a Christian? Look, this is no time for crybabies. I, I know what it's like to fail God. I know what it's like to totally, totally fall flat on my face again to, to God. But I thank God for his grace and mercy. And if all you want to talk about is his grace and mercy, then so be it. But there, he is also the God of wrath and judgment. And the grace and mercy is there because wrath and judgment is coming. And we have not much time left. This little girl cried out, said, please come. We're in trouble. The nations are in trouble. Those who don't know Christ, they're in trouble. Did not Jesus die on the cross so that you become the body? You become the salt and light of the earth? You are his instruments of righteousness. You're to be building blocks to encourage them, not be stumbling blocks, but building blocks to encourage. And I just want to encourage you that if you call yourself a Christian, it's more than what you're doing right now. There's more to be done. And God can sustain you. God can give you an incredible, an incredible strength that you never knew existed. He can give you an opportunity that you've never had. He can take you places you never thought would be possible for his glory alone. He wants you to live in the supernatural because he is the supernatural God. But we come at him with our human reasoning and our human understanding. And it's not going to work. That's not going to be the way it is. It's by faith. It's by faith. The just shall live by faith. And there's got to be a, a fire in your heart that's stirring. You're starting to see this injustice the way God sees it. You're starting to see what Satan has done for so many years. You know what is the most powerful thing we can do? Pray. Pray privately and pray publicly. And yet, it's the most least thing that you do. It's the most least thing. And that's why I, this old little preacher, is not surprised that there's no revival. Because you don't want it. Because you're in idolatry. You're still busy with your own things. You're looking at your own frailties, your own weaknesses. When Jesus himself said, no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. 
A rich man, a, a, a man said, Jesus, I want to follow you, but first let me go bury my father. And Jesus said in the Bible, uh-uh, let the dead bury the dead. You, you come follow me. What does that mean? There may be some obligations that you have, but when Jesus calls you, those obligations have to change. Not that you abandon family, that you abandon your loved ones, but you need to be ready for change when God says, follow me. Because many are called, but only a few have been chosen. Now, the Bible says that the violent, that the, the heaven will be taken with violence. Meaning there's gonna, you're going to get to heaven through much persecution, through much trials and tribulation. And if you're always on your phone, if you're always on your social medias, if you're always in gossip, if you're always having your head out of the will of God and not in the will of God, you think you're going to make it. And you're, what kind of example are you leaving to those who are watching you as you confess to be a Christian? In Jeremiah 7, 16 through 20, Jeremiah goes on to say, look, this is what God says. At one time, you know, let me just tell you this. Look, there comes a point in time where God says, I'm sick of you. I'm tired of you. Look, right here, look. God says, verse 16, therefore, God tells Jeremiah, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a prayer cry, a prayer, a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Here's the faithful prophet, and God's telling this prophet, don't pray for them anymore. No I'm not going to hear it. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There comes a time where God says, I am done with this society. The flood came. Fire and brimstone came down one day on Sodom and Gomorrah. And wrath and judgment is coming onto this world today. It's coming. It's coming. When you have so many, and it saddens my heart, you have so many ministries here in America that have the ability to be an incredible influence for God, and yet they're leading people straight to the fires of hell. And I'm not concerned about having a big church. The Lord said, Michael, I want a pure church. And how does a church become pure? By the pure preaching of the word of God. By the pure preaching. And if this is not for your ears, then you're not fit for the kingdom of God. But I know that there's something tugging at your heart. You know that what you're hearing is truth. We are living in those days. Look at the evil that is happening consistently. Jesus said it'll be like birth pains. It's happening every day now. Every day we see this happening. Whether you like it or not, you can stick your head in the sand and act like it doesn't exist. It's here. The day of evil is here. The times are here. Now, he says in verse 17, do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Do you not see what New York is doing? Do you not see what, uh, what's happening in Houston? Do you not see what's happening in the streets of Uvalde? Do you not see what's happening throughout the world? Verse 18, the children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. It's the whole family, God says. The children, the father, the mother, they're all caught up in idolatry. And that's what we see happening today in the world. The whole family is caught up in idolatry, provoking the anger of God. Verse 19, do they provoke me to anger? Look, with a question mark. Says the Lord, do they not provoke themselves to shame of their own faces? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my anger and my fury will be poured out in this place on man and on beast and on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. This is a prophetic thing that God is talking about, that wrath and judgment is coming to this world. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall remain forever. This world will one be done away with. We're seeing tribulations come. Look quickly, Leviticus 18, 21. God says, and you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech nor shall you profane in the name of your God, I am the Lord. Who was Molech? Molech was a God, a false God, that when you offered your children up in sacrifice, you would have blessings. And the majority of abortions today are because these kids are an inconvenience to their lifestyle. No different from the ancient worship of Molech. And God said, this is the pass down to all of your descendants even to us today. 
God loves us all. And the last one, again, Revelation 22, 20 through 21. Jesus says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, this is Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day being tomorrow. But we have to have memory of what Christ has done for us. The ultimate soldier, the ultimate warrior, the ultimate king, the ultimate one, the almighty, the only one, the king of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ. Our allegiance belongs to him. Our devotion belongs to him. Look, it takes a real man to follow Jesus. It takes a real woman to follow Jesus. Because Jesus said they persecuted him, they will persecute you. And a lot of people run from that today. They don't want trouble in this world. They don't want, they want their own business and that's it. And that is not why Jesus came to do what he did. He came to set captives free. There are people still in bondage. And the challenge is for you, Christian parent. The challenge is for you, Christians, period. Is that you, through prayer, through the study of the word of God, that you find the call of God in your life and that you be faithful to it, that you rise up for such a time as this. You were ordained by God to live in this day, not in the day of Noah, not in the day of Sodom and Gomorrah, but in this day. And if you will be a prayer warrior at home and with your church, if you will lead, be a leader amongst many, then God will use you mightily. But many are called, but few are chosen. I'm seeing more cowards than those who are willing to take up the mantle of God in this day that I'm living. I see so many that just offer lip service to God. And he's so worth so much more. I mean, I'll stand up here and be honest with you. I, and I'll say it again, and I'll always say it to the day I die. I know what it's like to fail God. But that's not me today. I know what it's like to fail my family. But that's not me today. But I can't look back on the past. Because the past will hold you. You need to look forward. And you need to trust in God and go forward. Because there will be many in your life, there will be many in society who do not want God, who do not want Jesus. But as Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Though my children are adults now, and I'm a new grandfather, I'm still responsible for my children to the day I die. I'm to be an example for them because they're going to, need me to help them as they raise their children with advice or with babysitting or whatever it is. Our job as Christian parents never ends. We never punch a time clock and said, okay, I'm done. No. And not only that, but I have so many spiritual children. We have a school and all these children, they're my children. Because if they're not my children, then that's not good for those children. They're just students. No, they're our children too. They're our responsibility. And you know why we love them? Why we love them? Because Jesus loves them. And if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for all of us. We need to take responsibility with the generation. We need to take responsibility of our little community. We need to take responsibility of what's in our church. And more importantly, we need to take responsibility of what's in our home. There's a lot of Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-filled churches out there, this one too, that needs help. We need help. A lot of people missing this morning. Some are working. Some are out of town on vacation. Some are sick. But whatever it is, churches need help. We have people in this ministry working two, three ministries here in this church. And they're overwhelmed but they're happy to do it. And so my encouragement to you online is if you're in the area and you're blessed by this ministry, come visit us and be a part of something greater than yourself because that is when you're truly going to be blessed. Jesus washed the disciples' feet before he went to the cross and he said, now when you understand what I've just done, then you'll know what it means to really be blessed. 
And God just doesn't want to just bless you. He wants you to be a blessing to others. And so be of great encouragement this day. As the little girl cried out, she said, please come, we're in trouble. And as many law enforcement officers ran as they're trained, they run to trouble. They're trained to do that. Christian, you're trained to do the same thing. When the towers were about to fall in New York City, and I've been there, and I've seen that, and even 20 years later, you still go to the exact site, to the memorial, and you can still feel a heaviness there. And I'm talking spiritually. You feel it there. Because that day changed a lot in the entire world. And God was there, and God was heartbroken at such the loss of life. God was there throughout all the past wars when people died, men killing each other, brother killing brother, nation killing nation. And sadly, it's not over yet. We're going to continue to see these things happen to the very end. But Christian, you're trained by the power of the Holy Spirit to run into trouble, to be an encouragement, even if it's something as simple as coming to prayer meeting. Miss Faye told me, oh, pastor, she's in her mid-80s. She says, oh, pastor, I can't wait to get back home. She's up in Missouri visiting family. She, she's here all the time for prayer meetings, Friday night, study, Sunday. And, you know, it's not easy for her to get around, but she gets around. She, it's so important to her. She's always calling you. You know, she calls y'all, though, too, right? She calls y'all. See how y'all are doing. She says, that's my ministry, pastor. She says, I cannot do too much anymore, but I can pick up a phone and I can call people and encourage people. I can check on them and see how they're doing. And that's what she does. All part of something. We all have our jobs to do. And that's to bring life into the church. And so I just want you to hear this. As people today are struggling to understand why this has happened in Uvalde, Texas, why this has happened in New York City, why this is happening all throughout the nations, all this murder and in this injustice. We just need to be the body of Christ and show up and put up in faith and in love. Receive that word in Jesus' name. Give God praise in this house. Amen.